Welcome to the Insomnia Project. Sit back, relax, and listen as we have a hopefully mundane conversation that you can just drift off. Once again, thank you for joining us. My name is Marco Timpano, and joining me in the studio is Deborah Kimmett, who I'm very excited to have. I'm going to try not to be too excited because we know each other through many different circles, but this is the first time we've actually met. Yes, thank gosh for Facebook and yeah. all these social media sites we get to follow each other. Welcome, Deborah. And, you know, I do appreciate you will often comment on my Facebook post, and I'll comment on yours, and your comments always bring joy and laughter to me. Good, so good. I'm grateful for that and for you for being here today. Thank you. We're going to talk, we're going to start a conversation about and talking about culverts. Yes, yes. Uh, tell me what a culvert is, first of all. Well, it's something if you live in a city you don't usually think about. Right. But if you live in the country where I lived, out in the wilderness, a uh, culvert will take the water away from your house. So if there's water pouring in from the field, They'll put a culvert under the road and then often drain the water away into the lake or another water supply. So So a culvert is like a drain or a tile bed, you might call it, where it drains the water past your house. So runoff water, are we talking rain? Does it act like the... Uh, down, or what do you call it, the drainage pipe we have around the house? What's that called? You have the gutters. Like- it's like that except around your land okay. instead of around your house. And I lived on an island where... Which island was it? Uh, Amherst Island, which is, if you think of the Thousand Islands, it's the one before the first thousandth. It's the an pre- integer. The- <laughs> it's an integer, minus one island. The pre-island? It's pre-island. Okay, or the pre-thousand islands. Yes, and there was a field across the way. Sure. And underneath the road was a, like a, like a culvert is made with a metal cylinder thing, and the water flows through it. And then that water drains off the field past my house into okay. the lake. Is it like corrugated, uh, like a half circle of metal that has kind of a corrugated spiral look it to it? It does have okay. that. And when you were a kid, you might have actually gone into a culvert to run through it underneath the road. If Fish you were in tadpoles. Well, you, or you could have a fort or you could play fort, mm-hmm. you know. So, so tell me about your culvert. You needed well, a culvert? Well, I had no. Okay. I was on the island and I was... On my own, my kids had left home, and I say this like I'm pathetic, but um, I was really feeling hard done by that. The whole house was my responsibility, sure. and I was trying to get off the island because okay. I couldn't afford the house anymore. Okay. And then one day, the township knocked on my door and told me my culvert had to be replaced, but it was going to cost me $4,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I had a fit, and I found out the man who built our house had not installed the culvert properly, and instead of going around our property, it was part of it was going underneath my garage. And so I became absolutely obsessed with culverts. Okay, I started to read the tile and drainage act of Ontario, uh, Tile and Drainage 323. Tell me about that act. Well, you know, you can't... uh, So I said, well, I don't want it replaced. And if you're going to replace it, um, I said, well, I could plug up my end of the culvert. Sure. Sounds reasonable. Yeah. But they said that was illegal. So I read the Drainage Act. And um, just ironically, I do suffer from... Um, insomnia, and I literally could fall asleep to this. It was if, if you you know really need to sleep, you should read the Tile and Drainage Act of Ontario. Would it be wise to have the Tile and Drainage Act of Ontario as a bedside reading? I absolutely <laughs> think you should. And then my brothers who are in construction sure. 
they would call me with new bylaws. Oh, my goodness. Because my dad had been in municipal politics, and he had been instrumental in changing some of the township bylaws. With regards to drainage? Yes. Okay. Yes, very important man. There's a road named after him. Wonderful. Not a culvert, a road. Okay. Um, well, what is the road and where would we find it? It's in Napanee, Ontario, where I'm from, and it's named Jim Kimmett Boulevard. Okay. And he built this road uh, as part of his, you know, industrial development. So my brothers were coaching me on how to go to council and get them because what I found out, I had an illegal culvert. Oh, wow. And it was going underneath my garage. garage and I was going to have to rip out the garage. And I was trying to sell my house. I see. And this kept me up at night. I was crying. Oh, my goodness. And uh, I found out that it had been illegally installed, which meant that the agreement I had in my real estate agreement was no, uh, void and null as well. Oh, my goodness. It was uh, uh, literally driving me crazy. And, and, and almost people wanted to stage an intervention. A culvert intervention. Like if I mentioned the word one more time, they were going to just... Sure. Like, in fact, my one friend said, if you say... Culvert. <laughs> one more time... We are going to have to hurt you. And and her husband was like, just sell the damn house. How did you get past the culvert situation? Like, uh, what's the other side of the culvert? Well, I approached the township clerk, who was a woman. Yes. And I thought perhaps she and I could come to some kind of agreement about the culvert. But right. she put me in my place because she, it turns out, being the township clerk, knew more about the Tile and Drainage Act than I did. Okay. So and did she have insight to help? No, she just... She just stopped you in she your She stopped me, okay. and it wasn't any, like, sisters of the traveling pants. No. We were not connected. No, because we're not dealing with pants here. We're dealing with culverts. We're dealing with and tiles culverts, and drains. Tiles, dry, drains, and culverts are serious business yes. is what I'm gathering from this conversation. It's very serious okay. because what I realized was literally we had bought... Swampland. Oh my goodness. So without this culvert, we would have a flooded area. Sure. So when my friends staged the intervention, they sat me down and they said, You're not allowed to bring up the word again. Okay. You know, like, and I would try to sneak in like tile bed. Right. But no, no. And I had to call my brothers and say, We we have to give up. And uh, my lawyer said, I told you. You had to get up. You'll never win this culvert right. fight. Right. And um, I'd been imagining sort of a movie scenario where the finally the little woman won. Sure. And so it was my guy that cut my lawn. Okay. And I was crying one day, and he was out clipping the bushes, and I came out of the house crying. I didn't see him there. Sure. And he said, oh, my, Deb, you know, you're never going to win against the county. You're right. not. They're a big, big enterprise. Sure. And I said, you're right. And then he hugged me. Mm -hmm. And I had a feeling he had a crush on me, but it didn't go anywhere. Fair. You know, fair enough. And um, and I eventually love gave... In the time, love in the time of culverts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't even know how to say that. He actually came out of the closet about a week later. Okay. Honestly, that's the truth. Fair. So I guess that's what the tile beds can do in culverts. And anyway, I think it's um, it's very much a country story. It's not a city story. Sure. I think when people in the... You probably haven't dealt with a culvert. Have I you? haven't. But I know that, you know, your weeping tile in the city can be a big thing, yes, right? Yes, and very much money. And very much money. And, you know, it's always, I'll, you'll know what I'm talking about if you've never seen weeping tile issues. When you walked past, walk past a home in a city, and you'll notice that the base of the home has been excavated a bit, and you can see what lies under the ground in the home, and they're sort of painting it with a black tar. Mm -hmm. That all has to do with weeping tile. And yeah. older homes have weeping tile issues. Yes. And it can be expensive and it can be problematic. Well, I think the thing that most people don't realize, mm -hmm. too, is that you are 50 percent responsible for the financial cost of your tile bed. Right. And weeping tile beds, to me, is the perfect title if that was my memoir. Sure. I was weeping a lot. And um, 
my brother is an excavator, so he, you know, deals with this a lot. And, uh, and you had the added um, stress of it being on an island. You're dealing with, you're on an island, so you're not in a in a larger type city. No. People have to come to you to deal with this. Conversation. Well, and also I found out that the guy who had been the building inspector was a cousin oh. of the person who s- built it wrong right. and approved it. So it was very uh. stressful. And um, I would have had to go back in history and try to reconnect it. Right. So I gave up on the culvert and um, I put the house on the market and... <laughs> you put it on the market without the proper culverts in? Right. Okay. Uh, well, we knew they'd have to be replaced. Sure. And I put it at the top of the real estate agreement. Okay. There is a faulty culvert okay. here and it could cost you money. And it turned out that it sold anyway wow. to my chiropractor because he wanted the house. There you so go. he was fine with that all. So, you know, um, you, you make dramas out of things sometimes, don't yeah, you? What is, the, what is the lesson you've learned from the culvert situation now that you're way past the other end of it that you might suggest to anyone who might be listening who's going through a situation that really is impacting them daily like it, it impacted you and it was all consuming and whatnot. Now that you've been on the other side of that, what would what would be the What's lesson? What's that or- thing called something loss where you try to keep um, – it's like there's a d- law of diminishing returns. Sure. Like if I had stayed in the game and kept paying my mortgage, I was never going to get that money back. So it was so good when I just gave up and mm-hmm. said, I'll put it on the top of the real estate sure. and agreement and I won't hide it. And then all of a sudden I realized sometimes you stay in the game longer because you've um, it's a sunk hole cost or something. Sure. It's where you've sunk so much energy yep. in you want to win. And for me, this is going to sound really crazy, but my husband, I bought the house from him and I thought I'd gotten a good deal. Sure. And I was really, it wasn't even about the culvert. I was just like, oh, great, I'm going to lose money again. Right. And he's going to win. And meanwhile, he was on, moving on with his life. But once I realized it wasn't about the culvert, it yeah. was about like I had to give up this. The house sold and I ended up, you know, getting a nice two bedroom apartment and it was more in line with who I was at sure. that time in my life, yeah. right? But sometimes we hold on, don't mm-hmm. you find? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You, you're saying the word give up, and I'm not trying to cycle. Surrender. Yeah. I'm not trying to psychoanalyze you, but allowing that just to release and flow, yeah. go with whatever flow it has to go with, really brought it to the other side, which brought you to a place that was more in line with what you were looking for at that time in your life. Absolutely. And I ended up getting a great trip. I sold my house, and I went on a nice trip, and... And I also realized I was trying to hold on to this old lifestyle because I thought I'd failed by not getting as much money from the house and the market had changed and all that. And so the culvert was just kind of where you put all your focus, you know? Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, anyway, it was hilarious because as soon as I gave up on the culvert, the move just happened really easily and I found a great place to live. Where, yeah. What trip did you go on? Well, it was actually the first time I went to Mexico, and I oh, went okay. for a couple weeks and uh, ended up staying with people I barely knew. Um, I'd met them at a conference once, and b- that began, began like a seven-year friendship. So oh, you say, again, you don't know sometimes in life you're going to give up something, and sure. then something else, you make room for something else. That's wonderful. What a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now, Deb, we were talking just moments before we went on air, and you said you have a lot of friends named Deb? <laughs> yeah, my friend... Uh, Coral said that my memoir should be called All My Friends Are Called Deb. Amazing. They're all called Deb. I mean, there's at least eight Debs in my life that have been dear, dear friends. We were, I'm, uh, I was born in 1957, and I think every woman in that vicinity was either called uh, Deb from Debbie Reynolds or Deborah Kerr. Okay. And she was an actor, right? Yeah, uh, so a very classy kind of British actor. You saw right. all those black and white movies. And uh, what's so funny is all the Debs have, um, like, there's uh, my friend Deborah Dixon. She will not be called Debbie. Um, I mean, remember we, that. If you we, bump into Deborah and Dixon, never call me Debbie. Uh, never call you oh, Debbie. Okay. I literally can't take it. I can't even hear. S- some older lady could call me Debbie, and I'm excited. Sure. But Deborah. Isn't that funny? Like, for example, my name is Marco, and if you call me Mark, I won't even hear it as if you're calling me 
my name and it sounds like you're calling someone else or like it would be like saying Donald to me. I'd like look around the room and it's like, can you talk to me? <laughs> I just don't hear it as my name. My name is Marco, yeah. not Mark, even though I know that's the dimin- diminutive or the anglicizing of my name. I just don't hear it that that's way. Good, yeah. I, not to put fault on anyone who might call me that. It's just I don't hear it as my name. I know. And Deborah is like I notice with my friends they're very much Deborah okay. or Debbie. Okay. And uh so, but most people at a certain point don't want to be called Debbie anymore, but mm-hmm. the first thing you do is say hi, I'm Deborah and they right. go hi Debbie and I'm like what happened here? Did you not hear what I said? Yeah. And um yeah, and then uh, my first uh, that was my friend and then my first uh, comedy writing partner, we were called the two Debs. And then Deborah McGrath was in the oh, touring course. company with me. Yes. And she's a wonderful Canadian comedian. Yes. And, and then over the years, I've had friends. My dearest friend is Deb, Debbie Earl. She doesn't mind Debbie. There you go. But they're all very distinct. They're like a snowflake. They're sure. not all the same. Yeah. They're very different. And I realize it's kind of like watching little parts of yourself, but they're all named, you know, how your inner being or your, you know, you've got like little p- parts of yourself inside of yourself. And I'm like, but they're all called the same name because they mm-hmm. all, none of them know each other. Sure. None of them Isn't really. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. And my friend Deborah Jarvis passed away this February. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, she was amazing. And what was so strange was when she died, all the other Debs were like calling me. And it was like, I hear Deb died. And I'm like, this is so weird that all the Debs have never met. Right. You, you could have like a, a Deb party where you can't come to the party unless your name is Deb. Yeah, and there's always a couple exceptions, right? I wish some people just had a middle name Deb and sure. then I could still invite them. Right. <laughs> well, you, you can invite them to just serve and work on the periphery. <laughs> this is you work the bar at this. You can have a bit of fun, but you're here to work. Oh, Whereas, I used to serve the Debs. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. Because yeah. Debs are a bit arrogant, you know, because they're all Leos. Nearly every single one of them really? are Leos. Are you a Leo? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I know, but it's like can you imagine anything worse? Leos being served <laughs> we live for. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I'll tell you this. The Debs that I know or the Debras that I know First of all, I I think they're tremendous people. <laughs> they're, they're, they speak their mind, and they're a lot of fun to be with. Is that a general thing? That's for the- a, if I was to say, like, there's certain names, you know, that I have in my life. Like, I, I mentioned this in another episode where it's like every Nick I've ever met, I've really liked. I thought they were really lovely people. They were just, it's just like, oh, you're Nick? And it's like, what a great person, right? Saint Nick, yeah. Or something. There's something about that name. And not that I particularly like that name, but it's just like every Nick I know is really great, right? And uh, every Deb I know is, you know, enthusiastic and bold and blunt, but fun to be around. Yeah, it's quite a bunch of energy. When yeah. you, if you imagine them at the party, there wouldn't be any oxygen, really. Sure. Yeah. No, it's funny how certain names like that. Mm. And I, and they're also, I think, they're names that wouldn't be today's names. You know, there would be no, there's no children called Deb. It, you know, Are we like Gertrude's of the 1800s? Like we're like Hazel and Gertrude sure. and then it'll be Deb. Is like It's going to be one of those names. It, well, they all come back, right? So my wife loves finding out what the names of the year are. So like she'll find out what – there's like a list of like 2020's name of the year, what they're naming babies or the most right. popular name. She's, I don't know why. She's really I think she's that. right to do this. And she see, she'll, like, I'll mention a name to her and she'll be like, oh, that was a very popular name in the 70s. Like Sabrina. She's like, that's a big name in the 70s. Yeah. You won't hear it now. And she'll be like, the name Gertrude is coming back. These oh, sort of gosh, older that, names. Yeah, these names. I think if are, you said that in the German accent, it might be nice. Gertrude. F- fair. Yeah. Fair. But like these certain names that we haven't heard in a while are coming back and certain names that were very popular continue to be popular. Uh, for example, I think Wayne is a very popular, consistent Canadian male name. You think now? How many kids do you see that are Wayne? Not many, but then again, I'm a bad I'm a bad person to ask this. I would have to ask my wife, like, when was the last time Wayne I was I bet you top... she knows the Aidens. Aidens are, like, rampant uh, yeah, at the moment. Of course. There's a lot of Aidens. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the name Madison? Madison oh gosh, yes. It, um, they're about eighteen now, aren't they? Or twenty? Yeah, there, it's and it was. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't a name before the movie Splash came out, where Splash with Daryl Hannah and Tom Hanks. Really? He was like, "What's your name?" And she didn't have a name because she was a mermaid. 
And she pointed or something to the sign that said Madison Avenue. And he's like, Madison, that's your name. And I think that's how that name. I could be wrong, listeners. So if I'm wrong, let me know. But, but the that's... question is, why does a mermaid not have a name? Wow. I mean, if she can walk around New York. But anyway, never mind. We she won't get into she that. may have had a name, but she couldn't speak it in <sighs> English. Yeah, perhaps. maybe mermaid. She yeah. could speak it in mermaid. Sure. I wonder what my mermaid name would be. Well, you'd be a merman. Okay, sure. I'm I'm sorry. Is that how you identify? I'm Um, fine with that. Sure. (laughs) What would it be? Marco. I think that would be pretty good for a merman. Uh, I'm Marco the merman. In fact, that could be a next series. Because we're on names, and sometimes we do talk about names, I'm asking this question in this season. What is your Starbucks name? What is the name they write on your coffee or tea when you go to Starbucks? Mine is Markle. Like sparkle with a yeah with an M yeah they all, they'll always hear, I'll say Marco and then I'll get the I'll get the the coffee back and it'll say Marco on it which now I'm maybe that's my merman name is Marco but Marco would be yeah, your merman uh, name uh, I don't know if I have a spark I think they call me Deb oh they do call but, you yeah Deb. I don't think they do Deborah okay. or they D E B R A because they don't want to go for O R A H because sure. the cup's not that big. Yeah. yeah. What does Deb- it, what does Deborah mean? Queen Bee, oh, which queen. I think suits all the Debras that you're talking about. Well, I didn't even know that I was talking about I Prophet, was... the prophet from the Bible, and okay. she's also the Queen Bee. Oh, that's, that's what cool. she's Queen Bee. Yeah. Do you like honey? I love honey. I love honey. I think I if I could eat honey, then I can pretend I'm not eating anything sweet. Like if it's got oh it's got honey. Okay. I'm fine with that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not sugar. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Uh, uh, oh, that's great. That's so lovely. Would you keep bees? Would you be a beekeeper? Well, I would not. Okay. My sister does. Oh, she does? Yes. She keeps bees, and then she goes out, and she has the big thing on, whatever, the beekeeping thing. Right. And you take the honeycomb out of your – she has a little thing that you pull these little shelves out. Right. And the bees are all – um, buzzing around. Yeah, and then she'll take a big hunk of the honey and hand it to me. Oh, that's and I'm great. like, oh, okay, do I have to get stung to get Are this Are you honey? wearing the protective no, gear? No, I'm <laughs> just standing there like an idiot. <laughs> so she's all protected head to toe. And this is too dangerous for you, Deb. Oh, well, you don't need to have anything on. Yeah, oh, no, my good. bicycle helmet. I just got my bicycle <laughs> <That's> <laughs> on. Not... Yet I won't, <laughs> when I run around. Oh, my gosh, lots of bee stuff. But she, hopefully she gives you honey. Yes, yeah, she gives okay, so honey. Get, get She's some. all into organic stuff, you know. She does everything natural. That's wonderful. Yeah, she has a solar oven. A, a solar? I've never heard of this. I know. It's, well, like it's a lot like a culvert. You don't know it until you hear it, and right, now sure. you're going to be hearing it all the all time. All the time. Oh my goodness. Yeah, she has this little solar oven. She's kind of like if electricity should fail us, right. but she bakes these chickens in the solar oven, Okay, and they take a lot of time, sure. like, you know, but they're delicious. Would you say a solar-cooked chicken tastes better than a regular oven-baked chicken? Well, yes, because you're hungrier because sure. you have Been to waiting. wait longer, sure. but also someone else is cooking it for you, so that's always tasty. You know, she gets these, like... Free range chickens, okay. and you know, they're like 40 bucks to <laughs> eat sure. a chicken. And you're like, you just have one bite. No, but she's very good, and they're delicious. She is one of those people that really cooks everything locally sourced and healthy. And I always poo bop, you know, in comedy, you make jokes about that, sure. but when you're there, you're just like, that's really good. This it's really, really good. delicious. I won't say it anywhere else, but I'll tell you, yeah, yeah, this secretly, is... this is fantastic. Yeah, sure, yeah. Sure. Well, listen, I had such a lovely time with you on our podcast. Thank you for bringing the culvert situation to light. Well, there's a lot of people that will probably be resonating with this because mm-hmm. it's it's not spoken about enough, I don't think. No, I don't know? think so. And you get f- into a mess and you don't know. And the weeping tiles, I mean. Yeah. And the, uh, what was it, Tile and Bed Act? Uh, the the tile-, tile and Drainage Act, Tile- 131, Ontario. Yeah. yeah. It's, what- it's a really good read if you're, you know, need to get some sleep. Wow. Wow. Well, th- well, listen, you heard it here. Deborah Kimmett, thank you so much. Yeah. Queen Bee, hopefully we'll have you back uh, sometime. Uh, our season is ending. Uh, this season is ending. But in season four, we'd oh, love, to love to have you. love to come back. It's so great. We'll, yeah. we'll discover something else. And before we go, you have a CD that's coming out. Yes. Yes, I got. I did a comedy show for CBC Radio and um, Howl and Roar. They're an all-female-based uh record label and they're releasing my cd called downward facing broad and it's on october 9th and it'll be on 
all the channels, iTunes and Sirius Radio and all of that. So Fantastic. I'm very, very excited about that. So if you want to hear more from our Queen Bee, Deborah Kimmett, <laughs> uh, when did you say the release date is? October 9th. 2019. Mm-hmm. So uh, for people who listen in the future, they'll be like, oh, what year was it? They'll know. 1900. <laughs> we'll also put uh, it on our show notes where okay. people can go to find it. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, so that's great. Deborah, thank you once again for oh, being a part of me. the Insomnia Project. As always, the Insomnia Project is produced by Drumcast Productions, and this episode was recorded in Toronto, Canada. Until the next time. <laughs>